Thank you, Don. Let's go ahead and begin with our reading, 13 through 17. All right. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 13 through 17. Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to anyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. And keep a good conscience so that in the things in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. For it is better if God should will it so, if you suffer for doing what is right than for doing what is wrong. Amen. To that. And by the way, Jonathan, <laughs> sorry about this, but my briefcase is up a couple of rows, and I was going to use notes, which I don't do very often, so I forgot to bring them, but there are four pages stapled together. Either they're in it or on the bench, if you would be so kind as to help me with that. So here we go. We, uh, we read 13 last time, but it starts out with the, this, um, this question, who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? And so um, it's not logical. It's unreasonable that anyone would harm us for doing good. But they will once in a while. So 14 addresses that. And we, we talked about this a little last week. It does happen. And so um, just be ready for that. Peter's making that clear, that that is part, an important part of the Christian life, is a uh, you know, living in a holy way, uh, keeping our behavior excellent, but sometimes suffering even though we're only doing good. So in verse 15 now, because I want you to notice something. I had to have 14, 13, 14 for the context right here. Notice what's happening. Peter is, is kind of making a comparison. He's saying, don't do this. Ah, maybe... Uh-oh, so you didn't find it at all, or it's locked. I think it's just locked. I thought you were one of those professional lock, you know, Smiths, but I guess not. Thank you, brother. That was a great help. So we have a contrast here. Peter says, don't do this. Instead, do this. It's really important to catch that. 14, don't be intimidated. Don't fear. when we suffer for being righteous. But instead, sanctify Christ. He's, he's telling us. Now, it's, there, we have three options. If we suffer for being righteous, and if they're threatening us and intimidated, we have three options. One option is to be intimidated and hold back and not glorify Christ. That, that's an option. That's why he's telling us not to do it. There's a second one. We can do what is common with a lot of people. We can be violent and we can threaten and intimidate them back. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth is the excuse. It's a misuse of the scripture, but people misuse that one. We, we can do that. And of course, at the end of 15, it says, you know, when you give that reply, do it with gentleness and reverence. So neither being intimidated or intimidating, you know, fighting fire with fire is acceptable. There's a third way, and it gives three steps in that, but sanctify Christ. And so um, sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, all being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. So question number one, I'd like somebody to tackle. Um, so get ready to run, Jonathan. And that is this, what does it mean to sanctify Christ in your heart? What does that mean? We'll take Andy, Andrew, because he's close to you, because he has an idea. Well, to sanctify means to set apart, right? Amen. So, I mean, you're, you're specifically dedicating a portion of your heart, your mind, uh, to Christ. Beautiful, beautiful. To sanctify means to make 
holy, to set apart. It was perfect. And so he has a special place, and it's not equal with other things. And you know this. But it's my job to explain this in case somebody doesn't. Or to say, man, you are it. You are number one. I'm setting you in a place that nothing else is equal to. Christ, you are my Lord, my guide, my goal, and Bill. Exactly what Andrew says, and, and I see a little further from what I can see that if you're going to be troubled or bothered or persecuted for evil, as you're setting apart Christ in your hearts, realizing that's exactly what happened to him. Amen. So, and that's the kind of thing that helps me sometimes if I'm being troubled or bothered by something yeah. that I don't think I should be for Christ. I mean, th because I'm trying to do what's right. I think of, well, what would Jesus do and what did he go through? And so, I, you know, just part of that setting him aside in your heart, realize you're being like Jesus when you suffer for righteousness sake. Oh, uh, so, and it, it, that's a huge part of this book already in chapter two. It talks about suffering and burying up under it. And then it says, Christ gave us that example. And then in verse 16, we're going to get that same thing again. So I'm glad you're right there, man, because that's exactly right. And it is just so easy. I hope I'm the only one in here that, that suffers through the poor me syndrome. But I, I let myself think that once in a while, and I try to catch myself and say, poor me, what are you talking about? You've got shoes on. Your eyes work. Your ears don't, but your eyes work. And it's incredible what, what we had to be thankful for. And then I think about the suffering that Jesus went through. And, and probably, even though we will, some of us will suffer, some of us dearly as time goes on for being Christians, few will suffer like him. So great point. Michael? Um, I was just noticing at the bottom of the page that I have my journal. It, it was uh, citing Lamentations 3. And uh, it fit so well that I thought I would read it. Lamentations 3, 22 and 23. It says, um, oh, wait, wait, I'm sorry. The Lord's loving kindness indeed never cease, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I have hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, the person who seeks him. Mm -hmm. So it fits so perfectly what we're studying here, uh, that his faithfulness never ceases. We, we get up and from day to day, it may, you know, it may be built up one day and then it may wane another day. But God is the same every day. He's there with us. And he wants that to be deep on our hearts. Amen. Because we can get into trouble or just get caught off guard and forget for a moment or hours. And so, yes, that's, that's so important. Good. Second thing. So, so we're looking at this. It says, even if you suffer for being righteous, it's rare, but it will happen and does happen. He says, do not, do not, but. And then he gives us three steps. So the verse one, make Christ ex exceedingly special by himself above all. Secondly, he says, always being ready to make a defense to everyone. You know, that's a powerful command. I mean, not only important, because every command is important, but this one affects so many people and is commanded. Be ready to make a defense. So I'd like to just ask, let's throw out some obvious questions um, that, that will get asked. And, and Jonathan, as people raise their hand, they don't have to be in order. Just grab the ones closest to you, because there should be several answers here. If no one raises their hand, then just grab somebody. But um, so what's, what's some of the ones that people are going to throw out, Don? Prove to me that water baptism is necessary for salvation. Oh, boy. You know, I got on YouTube today. So, so water salvation, H2O salvation. And I'll, and I'll probably talk about it a little bit later. But I wanted to see how many there were. 
uh, just, just videos on that because, anyway, so I counted 60, and then I scrolled and scrolled. I looked at hundreds, and once in a while they'd salt something in there that, that didn't relate to it. Hundreds, and I never got to the end hmm. on is water salvation. So, so we need to answer the question. And of course, this chapter is really helpful on that. Um, oh, it's another one, real quickly. Andy, and loud, I'll just repeat it. Oh, yeah, can we trust the Bible? It's old. I'm sorry, I didn't see you were next to somebody. But the, Bob, you can't trust it. It's old, outdated, it's been changed, all this kind of thing. So, so I'll put, I'll just put, to be quite, uh, quick, and then I'll take on um, uh, Bill Downey's. So I'll just put trust Bible, question mark. Bill. Well, I, Andy stole all my thunder. Thanks, Andy. <laughs> uh, so many people say, what makes you think the Bible is inspired? Yes. So is Bible inspired? And I'll abbreviate here. But boy, is it, only only dishonest people would ask that question, right? I don't go down that alley. But but my point is, that's an outstanding question that some of us, many of us in this very room, asked. How do I know the Bible is from God? So that's good. Anybody else? Michael. And, some, then, and then Sam will go. Some are asking nowadays, is God good? Yeah. Is God good? Okay, and um, go ahead, Samuel. Um, <clears throat> why do you say that you only, that they ask you, is like, what makes you think you have the right religion? There's so many different religions, you know, there's Buddhism. Taoism, Muslims, all that sort of stuff, and they're like, you, you, you just have faith in one of the many religions. You know, yeah. what makes that, what makes you different than them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, again, for time's sake, I'll just put right religion. I mean, you're looking at just in, among the denominations, and many of them teach different plans of salvation. You look at it. Some say as high as twenty-five thousand denominations. Others say as low as under a thousand. But but how do you? And then you take on Buddhism, Shintoism, Zenism, uh, Muslim, uh, Islam, and and yeah. How do you know? You're you're one of many. Okay. And Andy. The God of the Bible allows rape, slavery, and promotes genocide. God of the Bible was it he promoted slavery? Did you say and promotes mm -hmm. genocide? The God of the Bible allows for rape and slavery, and promotes genocide. Yeah, so, so in other words, there's a, there's a famous atheist. He's arrogant, too, which bugs me. I just don't care to be around. A, a, but anyway, his name is Richard Dawkins, and it's clear that he's a, he, he's a glory hound. And, and so he really, he, he blasphemes. Just, just totally, um, you know, uh, in other words, we'll just put, I don't even want to put that down. I'm embarrassed to say that, but... Um, um, yeah, so I'm going to go back to this one. Is God good? There are many people that say he's not. They just point out, look at this, look at this, look at this. And, and uh, I'll leave it at that. And then Bill. I'm not sure. I didn't understand what he said about allows rape. Maybe what you're saying is that if there was a God, these things wouldn't happen. You know, like children wouldn't starve. I mean, how can, how can there be a God and that kind of evil be going on? In the world. Does this it, is, is the biggest. I cut you off. Are oh, you done? Sorry. No, is that? This is from my reading. This is the number one. I have one more and then we'll, we'll end. But the number one objection to the God of the Bible, that for my, what I've read, is this. They say that, that if God is good, he wouldn't allow suffering. But there's lots of suffering on the earth, so there is no God, or there is no good God. So I'll just put, I'll put the argument of suffering, and I'm not saying that I presented it real well, but the argument of suffering is the number one most used um, against the existence of God and Bill. There's a lot of people that say the God of the Bible oppresses women. Yes, and so that's another one that he can't be good because he oppresses women, and isn't that, and I'm not going to answer all these tonight, but oppresses, I misspelled it, um, oppresses 
women, and isn't it funny? Not funny, isn't it ironic? The Christianity has elevated women more than any other religion in the world and said they're equal to men in God's sight. They're worthy. God loves them. They're, they're, they're not to be treated as slaves or property, but as fellow inheritors, fellow. Just, but they use these. In fact, all the ones, if the God we believe in is true, and he is, all of these are false, but... but my point is, what are some of the arguments? This would be our last one. This one's connected to the suffering, uh, the conclusion that they typically will come to after they say God would allow the suffering. They say God is dead. Uh, um, evolution, oh, Darwin, he, he, he believed in God, and he went out there and studied, but when he went through severe, you know, uh, trials with his daughter dying and I think his wife dying, he, he's like, yeah, God made this world, but he's dead now. So, like, Yeah, so, so lots of stuff. Now, I know there's a lot more, and I'm glad you're aware of what they are. So, so if we're to sanctify Christ in our hearts and always being ready to make a defense, then that means we need to, obviously, to learn the most common arguments against the existence of God, against the inspiration of the Bible. We need to learn those and be able to teach the truth on them. We don't have to be an expert, but we should be effective. We should be able to, to go about that. And so, you know, I, I, I suppose it doesn't really matter which one you start with, but, but since this is the most common argument against the existence of God, I've heard it in the last year, that's a good one to start with. Um, what if someone says to me, there can't be a God because there's suffering in the world and a good God wouldn't allow that? And of course, I'll give you, uh, before I say anything else, I'll take Andrew's hand right there. I was going to say I take a slightly different tack on this. Uh, you don't necessarily have to be an <clears throat> even conversant on a lot of these different topics. What the verse says is, is that always be ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you. That's my testimony, if you will. Why do I believe in God? I, I have to be an expert on why I believe in God. Uh, you know, whether it's because I don't believe in evolution or whatever, and, and you know, but the, I don't necessarily have to know all the arguments for why God allows suffering. I happen to know a lot of them, but I don't have to necessarily know those. What I need to know is why do I believe in God? You do, or you're wasting your time, right? Well, I mean, that's what the verse says, right? Well, one more time? That's what the verse says, is to give a, an account for the hope that is in you. Right, right. And so they're asking to make a defense, and so you tell them, here's my hope, and so what about what we just said then? What is it, is it, I agree with you, that's what it says, to, to make a defense of the hope that is in you. Are they going to have questions for us? I can ask these questions here. So, if we love our neighbor as ourselves, whether this verse requires or not, because I probably take it differently than you. I think it's more general than that, but I get it. You're sticking with the verse, and I see that. I'm not, not denying that for a moment. But I am saying to love my neighbor, I believe it's pleasing to God if I learn the simple ones especially, because some of these are just really um, straightforward, pretty simple to handle, and... Um, and the rest of the book, um, First Peter, from chapter 1 through chapter 5, does talk, it gives us lots of stuff about the importance of soul winning, and so um, whether this diversity demands or not, and I appreciate you saying that, keep me honest up here, that's good. That's good uh, Bible skill, by the way. I would still go beyond that. You know, I, I found a very good tool to, to use, and there's hundreds of videos online that bring up all those questions and everything, and it's pretty much right on, on the mark with, with, with the doctrine. And their, their, um, their um, main, main verse, their, their, uh, you know, their uh, signature verse or whatever, is, is that first, uh, first Peter 3.15, you know, so, um, to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you. And that's uh, 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 Apologetics Press, 
I mean, they have hundreds of videos that, that cover in depth all, all these. All there these, really are. Uh -huh. Just a, a I, lot I, of them. I, I don't know. You're probably familiar with it. The, there, there's also an organization called World, World Video Bible School, which, which is, you know, associated with Apologetics Press. Anyway, they, they have hundreds of videos. So that it's just a tool I use. Now, I don't know. You may find that, that, that what they're saying is bunk, but, but I know it isn't. Well, you know, I think you need to read selectively or watch selectively, but I use the Internet all the time. I did today just to see where, where, where things were at about baptism. And, and so if they come to me and say, why do you believe there's a God? Defend yourself. Why do you, why do you with all the suffering, defend yourself. Um, I think that's a great way to, a great learning tool, but with the understanding that there's, there's some false teachers out there too, even though the idea of suffering isn't usually too abused. Um, yeah, good. Use the tools that are out there. There's another hand. There's a couple. Michael? I, uh, th there's, there's two things here that are, I've, I've seen them as kind of a dynamic <clears throat> within uh, speaking to other people. One thing, <clears throat> contrary to what a lot of people think, People are not really attracted by somebody who is just kind of vague and indefinite um, and, and really can't explain, oh. you know, or, or, or strives to be inoffensive, you know. Uh, and, and in truth, <clears throat> people have more respect for the one who makes a defense, an effective defense. But the key is the last phrase there in this verse. Oh, huge. Yet with gentleness and reverence. If, if you come across like Andy did tonight, forget it. I mean, you, you, just, you have no hope. <laughs> it was beautiful. You know, you did he a good knows job. that, yeah. But no, if you come across as somebody who's arrogant and obnoxious and, and like the people you were describing to some extent, you're not going to be very effective. Ooh. But if you, can, if you can convey it in gentleness and compassion and reverence toward God, then that person understands that you really care about them. You know, there's that phrase that goes, uh, no one really, uh, see, nobody cares about what you know until they know about, no, nobody cares what you know until they know how you. How much you know. Nobody cares how, how much, much you, you know, know until they, yeah. Know how, how much, much you, you care. care. It, there's truth in it. And Andy, and we're going to wait this time. So I kind of see this verse as a blending of both what Andrew was saying about it and what you're saying. And, and, and to me, it's kind of like, at the very least, I should be able to explain why I believe what I believe. Amen. I need to be able to explain that. And, and I can do that, but then a lot of times when you say that to somebody, they're going to come back to you. Yeah, but it, I, I understand you believe the Bible because of all the fulfilled prophecy, but how can a God like that allow all this suffering? And so we need to try to get better at giving those arguments. Yeah. I don't think God's going to, especially, especially if you're a new Christian, he's not going to like, it's not a sin if you can't answer every single one of those arguments all the time. But right. it's just one of those areas we need to be striving to get better at doing. So I'll, while you're going back to Andrew, I'll, I'll speak just a little bit. Well, Bill's right there. Even though you weren't first, we'll, uh, we'll go with the older elder. I, 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 think, I think Jesus is a good example because he often was asked questions and challenged, and he was ready for the right answer. He was asked about marriage. Who, who's this person married to when she, when, when he, and so he was ready. And I think he's our example. We need to be ready to give an answer, whatever it might be that comes up. Uh, but the principle here too is good, is that the main answer we need to have is why we have a fact-based hope in Jesus Christ and in God. So, uh, but yeah, he would, all sorts of things they asked him about, you know, and, and he would give the answer. A amen to we that. We should too. So Andrew's next. Along with what Andy's saying, um, uh, totally, totally agree. But, you know, understanding why I believe, and if someone comes up to me with one of these questions, well, uh, how, do you, how can you believe the Bible is inspired? You know, uh, the right answer to be, well, I don't know, let's go study that, you know, or, or, or why does God allow suffering? You know, I have an idea, but let's go, stuff, let's go, let's go figure that Ooh. out together, right? Um, it's, it's an opportunity 
Uh, you still have to be grounded in your own faith, but it's an opportunity to, to open up and look into some of these things, even if you're not. I mean, I think a lot of us have an idea of why God allows suffering, right? Uh, I, I think we have an idea of why the Bible's inspired. Uh, and, and, and we have some of those ideas, and I think we could maybe come up with a scripture or two and stuff, but it's a better opportunity to drag that person into a, into a discussion or a study on those subjects too. That's, because they ask I the love question. that. I, I, I love that because tell me, and after class, but let me know if your experience is different. But, you know, I've gotten, we've probably all been in some religious discussions uh, with Christians sometimes that we disagree with or with non-Christians without a Bible in hand. And, you know, once in a while, if they really know the scriptures well and you really know them, you can refer to a scripture. But I find that most of the time that's a dry well. And I love what you had to say, Andrew, because, wow, why not get the most out of that question and say, you know, I have an idea why, but, but uh, this is so, such an important question. And, and what, let's study it together. And, man... Um, you're just bound with the Bible in hand, uh, and maybe, maybe if you don't do it right at that moment, maybe you have a little time to prepare too, just more, much more effective on that. And then on combining this last point, I think I'm going to, I think it gets underlined as well when I hit my notes, but um, the gentleness and reverence. You said something that happened many of us, me hundreds of times. You know, you, you've had a religious discussion and you go, ah, man, what could I have, how could I have presented it better? Or what, it, or just my attitude, maybe I, I let myself get too tense. And so I, I pray, before, but the point is this, that those 10 minutes later ideas, they really come in handy. And you, and, and you already probably experienced it, but boy, you have those questions, you think it through, and they do come up again. And, and you're so ready, and that partly has to do with, with it, it ties in with gentleness and reverence. You're, you're not just pushing ahead with a philosophy you can't back up at all. You're, you're just, you're trying to grow, and you're showing care and concern for the other person. And let's see here. I put down... The gentleness can be really difficult. Even if you are a kind person, um, not everybody else is. There are some people out there that they have latent anger, maybe because they were raised in a denomination that just treated them like dirt, or or they got abused, or or they they saw hypocrites saying one thing and living another. But but. You know, even as a Bible teacher, it doesn't happen too much um, if you're gentle. But still, you will get those that kind of get worked up and angry and even insult. And, and uh, Jonathan, um, Andrew, Andrew and, then, and then Michael. But uh, boy, this is key if we can just stay calm. And I found that I do so much better, and I almost do it every time. I pray, God, no matter what they say, please just let me handle it with grace, the way Jesus would, and with gentleness. And then, uh, Andrew. Well, two things. Uh, one is a soft answer turns away wrath. Uh, the, the proverb tells us that, right? Um, but when, when, it, when, you're being, when you're making a defense here, that means you're being attacked. It needs it one more time. That it means one. you're being attacked. Attacked. And so it's hard to be gentle when you're being attacked. Uh, and so it's even more important to give that soft answer to turn away the wrath, right? Uh, so it's, it's, it's uh, when, when someone comes to you asking, they're basically attacking your faith. The, you know, why do you believe in the Bible? Why do you believe in God? You know, I mean, at that point, I mean, most of us are going to kind of back up and go, <laughs> well, <laughs> I do, you know, and, uh, and, and here's why, and here's why, and here, but that's not, the, that's not what the Spirit's saying here. The Spirit's saying, yeah, you have to do it gently. Uh, because if you meet them with the same ferocity that they come at you, you will never win. Even if you win the argument, you will never win the soul. Exactly. And I know I have that down here on the last point. I have gentleness and reverence. The goal is to not win an argument, but to win a soul. And that's so key. Was there somebody before 
Bill? Um, I think you were then, and then Bill. Yeah. Uh, Michael, uh, uh, he's yeah. got his own mic, yeah. Yeah. Um, what I mean, I've heard what Andrew just described as, as being kind of like linguistic jujitsu. You, you take the force of what that person is coming at you with, and, and you, you c commiserate with them to a moment. In other words, exactly. you know, they talk about the suffering of children. That is tragic, and it's horrible, and, I, and, it, and it's really difficult for me sometimes. You know, and, and, and in other words, uh, validate that their, their feelings and their thoughts without... And, but, and, and oftentimes that takes a person off guard and allows them to drop their defense for a moment and allows you to, to, to put something in, you know. Or, or, or um, yeah, th that is a good question. How can we trust a book that's that old? I mean, what other book do we trust that's that old? But there's some things about the Bible that you should consider, you know, that are different from any other book that's ever been written. And, yeah. and you could then kind of turn it back around to where that person wants to kind of go and agree with you a little bit, you know, and, 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 and it, it's, just a, it's just a way of, as, as it says there, with gentleness and reverence, with, you know, ex validating them to, to the extent that you can to show the common ground. And it is so effective. I mean, for instance, and I'll get to Bill, but along that line, they said, well, there's so much suffering. How could a good God and... Fred, that's a really good question. I wrestled with that myself, and you should ask that kind of question. And so if we validate them, and other people are just angry at religion itself, um, at God himself. I know a young man, his, his father was a really wonderful member of God's church, and, and, and uh, uh, he died, and his grandson was just so angry at God for letting his grandfather die that their anger sometimes isn't even directed at you necessarily, but it's there. And so we just say, great question. I even hear anger in your voice, and, I'm, and I appreciate your question and, and feel bad about your anger. Let's, let's look at it. If, if you're open, let's just talk about it because I'm glad you asked the question. Bill. Oh. Yeah, uh, gentleness here to me is pretty clear how we're to do that. Reverence, I'm wondering a little more about. Is that like respect for the people you're talking with, even though they're completely, <clears throat> you know, wrong or don't have a clue about what they really should have a clue about, so you're not looking down on them kind of thing? Or is it talking about reverence toward God, like opposite of what Moses did at the waters of Mirabah when he <clears throat> answered their question, but he didn't do it in a way that was respectful to God. Right. So, I mean, I could see which, so what do you think about the reverence part? No, that's, that's a great question in and of itself as, as well. And so, yeah, I think it, the way I take it is a blend, not trying to cheat here, but, but respect for them, hold them in high honor. They are the precious to God, but also when we react, we're God's ambassador. And so we're to, to act in a certain way that's uh, a valid way of, of, of um, representing God. And so I, I took it as both, but I didn't, it's funny, I studied the gentleness pretty hard and didn't study the reverence um, nearly to the same degree. I just figured I knew what it meant to you asked me the question. Uh, so good question. Let's study that afterwards. If, no, great stuff. There was another hand, I thought. It was, was it Andrew? Yeah, I think it was Andrew that had a hand. I just want to say one more thing before you went on. Don mentioned apologetics pressed, and we, get, we have that word in our language called apologetics, uh, which comes from the word apology, which comes from the Greek word, uh, I believe it's apologio or geo, and, and that's the word defense right there is that word in this context. And, and so when you think of apologetics, that links to this verse because it's using that exact word. Great catch. Excellent, excellent. Mike? Yes. Take that one, one step further. The word apologetics comes from two Greek portions, apologeia, which is away from logic. In other words, the whole meaning of that word means that we are going to, um, we are going to depart 
in a lot, you know, toward logic to send to to uh, to travel toward a more logical understanding of something. Good. It, mean to apologize like we use the word today. No, it does not. It, it does not. And, and, and both are great. Both are really good. So let's look at verse 16. We'll actually maybe cover three verses tonight. It's kind of exciting. Um, uh, verse 16, because it's pretty easy, actually. And keep a good conscience, so that in the thing in which you were slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. It's almost identical to the previous chapter, uh, chapter 2, verse 12. So they both say this. They both have the, in the thing which you were slandered, 316 to 12. And then in, in 16, it says, it says, let me find my cursor, keep a good conscience, which really is inseparable from good behavior. If you have bad behavior, your conscience isn't right, it's telling you things aren't right. So the only way to have a good conscience is to have good behavior. But in the next one, not only they agree on, they both say in the thing which is slandered, but in 2.12, it says behavior excellent. That's the same thing as good behavior. Keep your behavior good among the Gentiles. And then it talks about good deeds, behavior, deeds, um, excellent, all this, all four of those phrases, two in each one, are almost identical, not by accident. In fact, I'm amazed at how frequently Peter refers to past points in this letter. And then even when you get to chapter 2, he's going to use the word um, remind and reminded three times. I'm writing to remind you, and uh, we need to be reminded. And, and so Peter's really highlighting some key concepts and hitting them in more than one chapter even. So, big deal. Anything else I want to say about that? Yeah. So, the main theme of this book, and I think uh, Jonathan and Andrew will have a thought, the main theme in this book <laughs> is you're going to read the word suffering in every chapter, all five, because it is an important part of life. And then he says more than once, chapter 2, chapter 3, and chapter 4, that we're going to suffer because, and only because, sometimes we're God's children. We're, we're righteous. And, and when we do that and we handle it well, boy, lots of good come from it. We'll talk about that when we get to verse 17. Andrew. So I, I don't know if you were going to do this or not, but it seems to me that verse 16 is linked back to verse 15 uh, by the conjunction and there. Um, but... In this case, the the thing that which you're being slandered is the thing that they're coming after you after, as right, and the good behavior is the gentleness and the and the reverence. Uh, so in this case, in this case, he's saying that it, when they slander you because of your beliefs, uh, if you you know have good behavior, so that Christ is not put to, to put to shame here. And that's kind of the way I look at this. Is this is pointing back to 15 as well as what he's saying in, in chapter 2, verse 12. No, it makes, to, I, I didn't connect the two. There are so many connections throughout this book. I didn't even pick up on that one, but you can see it because they all blend together. If you keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, if you do good deeds, then some of the people that slander us, they're going to glorify God. I did, oh, I didn't get to that part. Is it a, oh, uh, they're either going to glorify God, which is here, or be put to shame. And although they're not identical, I saw the last hand will take, but they are related. Some people that slander us and then they see our good deeds and our good behavior, they're going to be ashamed. And some of those may say, I was wrong and may glorify God. Not all the time, but I've been ashamed of my behavior before and corrected it. And so sometimes the, even the put to shame and the glorifying God will be very related. I had one more point, and then we're going to close. Michael. So uh, as we read in the book of Acts, and of course Peter is featured in the book of Acts, um, the, the apostles and the evangelists were always proclaiming a message on two fronts. 
They were proclaiming it to those who were receptive hearts, and they were also proclaiming it in front of those who opposed them. And those who opposed them would come up with these contrived accusations, but those who had sincere hearts would observe that, that the opposition was really improper. And, and by the response of the apostles, this is the, the main thing I'm trying to say, by the response of the apostles and the evangelists, they would demonstrate God's goodness and the, and the truthfulness of the message because they wouldn't have to strike out and, and be, you know, uh, uh, unreasonable like these uh, teachers of error were. Amen. People that are honest, that they weigh both sides, sometimes it just jumps out what the truth is and so forth. Great. Thank you so much. Look forward to seeing you on Sunday. May the Lord be with you.